when what comes to mind is that whole escapism, which for you is travel, but I see it also as in any form of addiction, which can be food addiction, it can yeah. be a shopping addiction, it can be an alcohol addiction, um, any of that kind of a, can be work addiction. I mean, any one of those escapisms mm -hmm. that takes us from feeling at peace within ourselves, feeling fulfilled that we don't have to fill up from something outside of ourselves. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you are watching or listening. This is The Holistic Monitor, and I'm your host, Nick Sconia. The Holistic Monitor is a wellness podcast featuring life energy research, health and wellness transformation, self-improvement and empowerment, philosophy, spirituality, and now guest interviews as well. We look forward to your comments on our YouTube channel, at Holistic Monitor, and you can also listen on the go with us at Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and more. And with that, let's get today's show started. Claudia Braun, Braun. Uh -huh. you are a uh, holistic coach. Yes. And a mindset coach. And a mindset coach. And you have uh, your own practice that you work with clients uh, to help them achieve, uh, is it a nutritional uh, no, mental, emotional, physical. I've actually sw switched. The focus really is on mindset work and really helping people let go of the guilt and obligation that's running them. So they end up creating lives they don't prefer. So that mm -hmm. really is my focus. Okay. Does, does the whole holistic kind of cover um, yeah. the mm -hmm. idea that the mind will be controlling these different levels? Yeah. Does that make sense? It okay. does. Yeah. And really my focus... Because what I well we could talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Want to, but um, my switch it has been a really conscious decision on my part is to really focus on people who really want to work on mindset work that they really see their own struggles causing lives that they don't prefer and my desire is to assist those people with mindset work so they can create the life that they actually do prefer. Hmm. Okay. So starting basically, and, and a lot of what I understand as far as uh, wellness and health and mm -hmm. uh, all of that uh, begins with the thought, begins with the concept, what's being conceived in the mind and generated out to the body um, through impulse, through chemical reaction, creating a, um, a health or a detriment to the systems. Yeah. Uh, so starting with the mind and getting that set and getting that figured cuts out a lot of addictions, cuts out a lot of uh, obsessive behaviors. Exactly. Which would lead to possibly potentially poor nutrition and things like that. So it's kind of starting lifestyle and, you know, making choices that are not based on who one authentically is. And that really is my passion is helping people connect to their heart and their authentic self. Hmm. That's my passion. Okay, so top down, the way I like to look at it, top down. Yeah. Do you um, do you use a certain system or uh, method? Well, I use so one of the I have tools that I use. Um, so tapping is one of them. EFT, emotional freedom technique. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a long time Course in Miracles student, so that really is a framework for me of how I work with my clients. That. I don't know how familiar with that, of course, miracles, but um, it is going from a fear mindset to a love mindset. So that really is my own study and my own work. And so mm -hmm. the work that I do with my clients is very much taking them from fearful, what's wrong with me, to a compassionate, loving relationship with themselves. So okay. And uh, just so that we're all clear on the course of miracles, is that um, reframing? Would that be yeah. what that is? So A Course in Miracles is a 365-day study of retraining your mind. On, on mind? Retraining your mind. To oh, retraining from, your mind. Okay. Because the current system that we live in, the world that we live in, is very fear-based. We all know it. You turn on the TV set, it's all about fear. It's all the horrible things that are going on in the world. Mm -hmm. I think it's very challenging for many people to 
not talk about what's wrong in any area of their life throughout the day or with their friends or with their loved ones. And so A Course in Miracles is about turning that thinking around and it actually teaches us that that thinking is not accurate thinking. It's something mm. that we learned. Because if you look, watch children, they are not fearful. They're excited, they're engaged, they're happy, they're loving. That is our authentic self. And we've been taught out of it. We've mm. been you know, systematically trained to not be that person any longer. Right, right. Yeah, the child's eyes. Yeah. The world through child's eyes. Yeah. And that and that training, I think it has or has previously held a specific use in um, survival, you know, in a mechanism of survival. There is a necessary balance of fear needed to survive in the world, uh, so that we're sharp, we're alert. But I think it, what you're getting at is more the uh, societal uh, manipulation of exactly. this uh, same energy uh, for consumerism, uh, mainly f to make sure that you keep watching TV or whatever it might be, yeah, uh, keep your attention focused in a specific direction. Exactly. Or that we all stay doing the same thing. Right? I mean, it start, the programming starts early. Maybe not in kindergarten, kindergarten, nursery school, we've got a little bit more freedom, but come first grade, second grade, we're all taught to line up. We're all taught that we can't talk out of turn. We're all taught there's a certain way you have to be. You don't, you're not in, there's something wrong with you if you're not able to sit and be quiet. I mean, right. there's a certain program when we've all kind of tapped into and kind of got, oh yeah, that's how we're supposed to be. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah, that is uh, through observation too as kids. We also learn to emulate what we see around us uh, aside from just specific schooling and training and we see what others are doing around us and that's what we try to uh, mimic yeah and we also see what gets rewarded and what doesn't mm -hmm. and kids who talk out of turn or kids who have you know you know have a lot of ideas or kind of big they usually kind of get squelched right yeah yeah that's like uh the dreams, they get a little smaller and smaller until yeah. we're not dreaming anymore. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what um, what got you started in this whole world of uh, holistic wellness? Yeah, so um, good question. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, what's interesting is that um, like others, perhaps I was, um, it's, the holistic piece for me started um, kind of, um, I don't know, happenstance, but I think there's no happenstance. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had, at the time, I had some kind of like allergy thing and a physician had given me some medication. And so I was taking it and I noticed I started to feel like symptoms from it, kind of drowsy, not quite myself. And um, somebody actually introduced me to essential oils um, mm -hmm. and it was tea tree oil. And she said, this is really good for a sore throat. And I used it and actually, it went away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, if this could do this, what else could it do? Right. And, and that opened the door for me on realizing the schooling that I had, that there's one way of doing things, this kind of medical model was not the best fit for me and my philosophy. What I didn't really know was a philosophy until I was like, uh, it just intuitively resonated with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I started studying that, um, and I got rid of all the other stuff that was in my cabinet, um, and I started seeing that as like a, a path for healing. And um, I had a full time job; I was in marketing, and um, but for my stress relief, I was doing yoga, um, and I was getting a regular massage. It was called shiatsu, a Japanese coming in ac acupressure and stretching. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to get really interested in that. And shiatsu, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with it already? Yeah, yep. Okay, I'll share just a little bit for anyone who isn't familiar yeah. with it. Shiatsu is a combination of acupressure and stretching. And it works with the energetic system that acupuncture does. Um, we have a meridian system in our body, energetically runs our body. Um, and the belief is Chinese medicine that um, there's the body's always trying to be in a state of balance, health. 
And so shiatsu is about balancing the meridian system. And I kind of fell in love with it, um, receiving it. And so I thought I would study. Hmm. And so I studied shiatsu and I, I actually, I, I went to school, I graduated, I had a practice um, and I loved it. And, um, but I found I was sort of coaching my clients. Um, hmm. And so in shiatsu, the every energetic uh, pathway connects to um, a organ and it also has a, um, it has an energy to it and it has a like things that are associated with it um, such as um, the, the stomach meridian is the digestion but it's also empathy or sympathy or worry and i was just like mm -hmm. so i got very interested kind of in the mind body spirit connection right so that kind of led me um to further study um i started combining more things i was trained in yoga and then I decided I really wanted to um, to work with people in a more full setting. And coaching mm. really, for me, kind of hit all of the boxes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And with uh, at your shiatsu practice, you probably were realizing, like you said, you were already doing the coaching. When you're working with somebody that you know has a chronic issue and um, you have steps that can help them clear that issue that they would actually need to do when they go home or the next day when they're not getting the the the, the shiatsu uh the treatment uh right. stretches and things like that that they can do to help themselves exactly you find yourself doing a lot of that uh in that field in the soft therapy uh what is nice about shiatsu uh versus um a lot of other types of practices is that it is hands-on it's integral you're working directly with a client uh to help like a pt helping retrain yes. and um clear yes it's very uh in in the physical realm uh but it it utilizes that that mapping that was developed in china for the uh, meridians and the chakras awesome the it sounds lines. like you're very familiar with it i can oh, tell yeah, very familiar yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it's quite beautiful work yeah yeah, but what ends up happening, uh, I actually myself uh, had a massage practice for four years. I didn't yeah. do uh, shiatsu, but I did sports massage and things like that. Uh, what ends up happening is that you, you teach the client these methods, and then it's up to them. And exactly. if they're like 90% or 95% of everybody else, they go home and they don't do anything. <laughs> sure. You're lucky if they even drink the water, you know. It's true. Um, but what do you find in a in difference uh, through your practice with coaching that you weren't getting and results with shiatsu? Well, it's a really good question, and I, what I know um, in coaching, I've been coaching for ten years now. What I know is what makes coaching effective is the accountability. Is mm. They have tools because it's just what you said. People have good intentions. I don't think they go, they leave going, I'm never going to do this. And there are some people that perhaps do, but most people feel like I'm going to do this. And they figure that by the time they come back for the next session, they'll have done something. Um, but most people, you're right, don't. Uh, and so with coaching, they have a coach, they have the accountability I work with them to do two to three things between the session and the next session. So everything is broken down into simple, small steps. They have somebody to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And what I do in my coaching, which I feel is really effective, is because a lot of my, everyone's changing habits. They're changing their mindset. So they need to change the way they've been doing things for maybe for 50 years, 60 years. It's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, I've, I've worked with people in their teens, in their twenties, in their thirties, in their forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies. The people that change the quickest, not surprising are the youngest people. They haven't been practicing as long. Right. But yeah. once you hit 40, 50, 60, 70, it's a long time of doing the same thing over and over again. And so what I find makes the difference in the work that I do in the coaching is that they have the accountability. 
they have somebody they know is asking, what did you do? Checking up on them. And it gives them the support that they need to pull them forward. Yeah, so that's more like um, hands-on um, well, coaching. It's more like being there with them through those steps, through that time where they would start to falter. Exactly. Um, to not do the thing that they're supposed to do. And then they have that accountability. Very important. It's I wonder, really essential. Yeah, I, I wonder if that could be incorporated with Shiatsu in a way that be like, here's your session and I'll be calling you tomorrow to make sure you stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Right. Um, yeah. For me, uh, I had had a shiatsu practice for over 20 years. So I, oh, for okay. me, it was the next step for me was I really wanted to coach people. I, it is, I went to social work school. So it is part of, I feel like, in my DNA to really support people. I love hearing people's stories. I'm passionate about going deep with people. Mm -hmm. um, I create a very safe, pay, safe place, nurturing space for my clients. And Frequently, people will tell me, I told you something I've never told anybody else. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, Shatsu was fantastic, and I loved my practice, and I'm grateful for the time I had with my clients. But for me, the next step was coaching. Right. Um, this is my love, um, mm -hmm. and I'm very thankful to get to do it, actually. Yeah, definitely. And you have a good background too with the Shiatsu. So I do, of... because it, yeah, it's a good mind-body-spirit connection. Right. Um, so I thank you. Yeah, I feel like I do. Yeah. And um, so, so were you able to bring your clients from Shiatsu into your new world? Um, some, yes. Okay. And some, you know, that's not really yeah. what they were about. Right. right. Um, and that's okay, too. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, a physical location for your coaching uh, practice? I don't. Um, I coach virtually. Um, okay. So, you know, one of the things I started my practice 10 years ago, and um, I always knew I wanted to be location unspecific. Hmm. I wanted to be able to work with people wherever they were. And I had clients who, even when I was working with clients locally, um, say, I want to I want to meet with you in person. And I had an office for a while. And I had a, um, a mom, busy mom, business, um, and she missed her appointment. And I texted her. I said, honey, you missed your appointment. And she's like, oh, my gosh. I said, but we can still do it. We could just do it now. I'm over the phone. And after that, she never did an in-person appointment again. <laughs> so I found that um, it's so much easier for people to do a virtual session. They show up for the time, right. and then they go back to their life. Yeah. They have it on their calendar, 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, they're already there because exactly. they're at home or wherever they're going to be. Exactly. It's on their phone. It pops yes. up. They say, oh, better we give a call. Exactly. 15 minutes. Hold on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. And I um, I do work, you know, like this. I work on video. We work on Zoom. Um, sessions can be recorded. So what you can't do as easily when it's an in-person session. So right. it's really nice for people to be able to go back to, especially um, I mentioned I do um, EFT or tapping. Yeah. Um, so if we're doing a tapping session and something has come up and it's something they're going to do again, it can be recorded. They can just do it um, mm. during the week. So I find it really works effectively. Yeah. Long-term instruction in a sense, if they can have it recorded. Exactly. They can exactly. Look back on it. Yes. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, hypnosis, they'll record the session so that you can go back and listen. Um, although every time I've had it done, I still remember the session, so I didn't need the recording. But uh, I'm sure there's details in there that I've forgotten over the years. But uh, now, do you, in your life, or were you naturally drawn to having a listening ear? Was this something that people always did to, for you? They did say, I'm going to tell you something I've not told anybody. Was that something that you had when you were a kid in high school for friends? Was it something natural for you? It's a good question. And um, I think probably for me, that was true. Um, people did tell me things. Um, people told me things or they leaned into me to share difficult things. Um, 
I was a go-to person for a lot of people. So, and I'm the youngest child of four. Um, so I don't know where you fall in your family, but as the youngest, um, and my siblings are a lot older than me. So I was a really good observer. Um, so I was listening a lot, a lot more than I was speaking. So listening and knowing what was going on with other people was kind of what I was raised to do. Um, so it, it, for me, it came really easily and naturally. And, you know, I am somebody who, it, I was just talking to somebody and they were saying they're not that great at small talk. And it wasn't really my thing either. I've become better at it as I've gotten older to get along in the world. Wow. Um, <laughs> but same, you know, really having deep conversations is really what excites me. And um, so it's great that I get to do it. Yeah, as a as a job, that's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect fit. It is a perfect fit. Yeah, um, and as far as uh, outreach goes, is this something that you do to um, groups? Is this something you can work with groups with, or is this something that's specific one on one? So it is something that can be done in groups. Um, and also one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so currently my practice is predominantly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I will be starting a group program in the next um, probably six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but currently my clients meet one-to-one -one and both work. Um, it's a different, I've run groups over my 10 years of practice. I've run groups um, and I find that both are good and it depends on the person because some people don't like groups. Mm -hmm. um, some people, I, I can't just say that anyone has ever been in my groups that they didn't like one-to-one, -one. Um, but some people don't like groups. They don't like being in a group setting, um, but some yeah. people actually feel like they do better in a group because they hear what other people are going through. Um, some people are really private and they don't want to share in a group. Right. Right. They won't share. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's, you know, some people who hide in a group. And so they know mm -hmm. that, you know what, that's not for them. They don't feel like they get their needs met. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I know for myself, a uh, certain size group is okay. But if it gets past like five, that's where I stop. Uh, I start just listening and, and not engaging as much. So I know that my control level where I will share in a group is, I think that's fairly low at five. But uh that's where I know after that, I start to blend into the, uh, the wall, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just listening, enjoying everybody else's stories. It's great. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, if you came there to do deep work, it's not right. for you because yeah. you're not going to get your needs met. Right. So yeah. it's a very different as somebody who has led groups one-on-one -on -one, been in group and also been in groups and received one-on-one. -on -one, my experience is that it's a very different experience. I've been in larger groups where it's over 20 people. And what I find is you have to be really willing to be assertive. Mm -hmm. um, and so my groups, though, are usually anywhere from four to 10 people. So it's pretty manageable for most people. Um, but it's just a different dynamic versus, you know, if you somebody who likes intensive one to one work, it's a different experience. Right. Now, um, how long would you say is uh, natural or normal for a client um, that you work with to go through the process with you? So the initial way of working for me, working with clients, my program is three months. Um, I work with people uh, for 12 weeks and it gives them a really good experience of moving from the struggle, the pain, things aren't working, to feeling like they have a system in place in their life. They can feel the transformation. So three months is where I start. I have had many clients who've stayed longer just because we work on one area of their life and they want to keep going and working on other areas of their life. So I've had people I've worked with for years. I've had people I've worked with for three months. So three months is a starting place, and it really depends on the person for how long they want to continue to work together. 
So in your 10 years of practice, um, have you had a lot of really good success stories? Um, are you seeing a lot of uh, long-term benefits? So much so. Um, you know, I have to say it's one of the rewards of the work that I do. Um, I have a client that I've been working with. Um, she was a referral, actually, and um, we were working together last night, and she said, um, I just wanted, I realized that I'm doing things so much differently than I did before. I realized I was talking to my ex-husband, and I'm so much clearer, and I offered him some solutions, and I just really simplified it for him, and, he, and she said to me, who was that talking to him? I, I didn't know. She just had such a different experience of herself. And she's somebody who used to get caught up in a lot of drama with her mom. And she's somebody in her 50s. She's not like she's a young person, but her mother is just, you know, there was always kind of stuff. And she was just so proud of herself that she was not like picking up the bait. Mm -hmm. And she was responding differently. And she was responding and she was conscious. And she just felt in control and happy and peaceful. And before it would have like really undone her and frustrated her and really caused her a lot of angst in her days. And it completely shifted for her. And she was just feeling so happy and so excited. And she had just celebrated a birthday. And she said, you know, I just I feel so much different this year than I have. Um, so she is somebody who I feel like is a, such a huge success. And she's just so happy with who she is. And she said to me, she's like, I realize how much work I've done on myself. Um, and I think that that is so much the, uh, the result of mindset work and really doing the deep work, which isn't necessarily visible to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like somebody who can say like, oh, I lost 100 pounds, or I bought a, I bought a million dollar house, or it's not like that. I mean, it's, the deep work that creates a life of relationships where you, the person feels more peaceful, more confident, more at ease with themselves, the choices that they're making. And it just creates an inner sense of feeling in control where before it just felt like they had to be just in reaction or in mm -hmm. reactivity to she, her mom or her ex-husband or whatever drama seemed to be going on around her. Um, so that was one person It comes to mind because we met last night. And then there's another woman who um, she uh, came to me. She, we, uh, she, had, she was in business. Um, their husband, she had two little kids. And she just, she said to me, she's like, I just want to move to an island by myself and not leave a forwarding address. That was how we started. And um, by the time we finished working together, she said, you know what? I said, you don't want to move to the island anymore. She's like, no, I do. She's like, but I want to take everybody with me now. <laughs> um, and it was just so different um, yeah. that she felt so much happier. She has said to me, she wrote me such a beautiful testimony. She's like, I feel like I'm a better mom. I'm a better wife. I'm so much truer to myself. I can show up for my community. Uh, she just was so much more expanded in her life you know they talk about you know mindset work is a growth mindset but it's just that feeling of you feel expanded you feel more possibilities more options mm -hmm. not in that limited life happening to me so right. those are two uh clients that come to mind it's just really powerful experiences as a result of the work that we've been doing together oh, that's great Thank you. yeah I'd, I'd say that um living in an unconscious life um, is kind of like living in a war zone uh, of your own making, in a sense. You just don't realize it. So Being true. caught in a battle and so putting true. a shield up here and a shield up there, constantly darkening the light that should be showing out. And when you get that right mindset, when you get that right state of mind, uh, you turn a light on inside, it kind of, uh, it does, it grows, it glows, it goes out and it radiates. And it changes the way that we look at uh, the desire to hide and run away is more uh, uh, the desire, not necessarily to be out in the limelight, but to not be afraid of it, to not be uh, 
you know, feeling like they're on the defense all the time. It's so well put, Nick, especially that, um, that defensive, right? Like having the shields up. Mm -hmm. Sure. The next situation, the next person is out to get you, or it's going to be bad, or it's not going to go well, or what's the next disaster I have to prepare myself for. Um, but it's so true, right? You know, as they say that when you let your light shine, you create a ripple effect in your small world, big world, because that affects the next person and the next person, the next person. So, so very true. And so well said. Yeah. I, I myself, um, traveled a lot and a lot of that traveling when I was younger was, um, somewhat of a, an escapism from the everyday. Yeah. And from responsibility and whatever, whatever I wanted to escape from, which is pretty much anything, because I could just keep moving. <laughs> it's real easy. Yeah. Um, and I, after a long while, was afraid that I couldn't stop, was that I was stuck in this uh, realm of um, not being content with being in one place. Yeah. And it, it took a while. I found myself where I had landed and I was there for longer than a month and then longer than a year and i realized uh, a lot about that sense of running away from something or running away from home or whatever it might be yeah. and that there, there has to be a piece that comes about a, a realization that um, you need to find home wherever you're at and that shouldn't be somewhere that you have to go to it should be right where you're at so true. And once I figured out that home was inside of me, I was very content not to uh, feel compelled. Let's say the wanderlust wasn't overtaking me and taking me on the road. Um, I'd love to travel, and I still love to travel, but I'm not. Um, there's not a uh, a natural or a uh, built-in reaction to the to scenarios to just flee or just disappear or whatever might might be the case. That's awesome. And what I hear and what I hear is the compulsion to mm -hmm. have to escape is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Once that once I realized it's almost like that home is where you hang your hat kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Except that I, I lived that in a sense. I made home wherever I went, but I was not able to stop. So it's almost like an addiction. It is. Something I couldn't stop doing. Yeah. It was initially a goal. It became a life. And then it was wasn't something I could stop. I wasn't sure if it was over. It could end. Um, and then once I figured out the mechanism, once I realized what that where the light switch was, I could turn on the light within myself. I could be content with where I was. Mm -hmm. I wasn't seeking for home. I wasn't uh, running away from things. Uh, that really helped me out uh, to just find that. Uh, I needed to be content in order to not feel that compulsion. So good. It's so good. <clears throat> and it's so true. And when what comes to mind is that whole escapism, which for you is trauma, but I see it also as in any form of addiction, which can be food addiction. It can yeah. be a shopping addiction. It can be an alcohol addiction. Um, any of that kind of escapism can be work addiction. I mean, any one of those escape isms mm -hmm. that takes us from feeling at peace within ourselves, feeling fulfilled that we don't have to fill up from something outside of ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's that mechanism that we were talking about earlier <clears throat> with balance, uh, yeah. trying to fill a gap. And we go into that a lot with, uh, with the SAF practice that we do is that we try to find something that's going to give us equilibrium and in our unconscious life in our just everyday life that we're living we're not thinking about things yeah. we're listening mm -hmm. to the deficit the the lack of something mm -hmm. or the abundance of something in us telling us what it wants and what it's missing or what it what it needs to try and fill or overflow always kind of teetering the balance um, we eat more because we feel a grumble, an emptiness in the stomach. So we put more in to try and find that balance. And it's an imbalance. You know, it's, it's very interesting how that, how that addiction will work. It'll cry out for its own thing over and over again. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. And the more we don't address 
the issue, the more <clears throat> the more running, the more escaping we do, mm -hmm. um, and the more things feel like they're out of control. So, yeah. um, kudos to you for you know getting underneath. It's a uh, a life process, right? So <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and upwards, yeah. uh, and where do you see your practice going in the next um, year or five years, if you look that far ahead? Yeah. So um, really, I, I see me doing more groups. As I love doing one to one, but there is also a benefit of one to many. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that as being the direction that I would like to continue to go is to be able to offer more groups mm -hmm. um, and be able to offer longer programs. Um, because as you know, as somebody who's on a path of transformation, transformation begins at three months. Um, right, and right. I love the idea of being able to hold a container for people to be able to expand into that as a group. Um, and then perhaps doing retreats like that. So that for mm -hmm. me is a, um, I have a lot of tools, um, to teach people and to offer to people. So retreat has an opportunity to bring all of that together. Um, so I really love the idea of that. So I think that's definitely down the road for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people doing retreats and I, I've, I, I get it. I, I can feel that concept of, uh, you know, the benefit of pulling people out of their place, out of their space, out of their head space and into a new environment that's solely like uh, fresh and, you know, give them a new experience and also realign their mind. Yeah. And then they get to go back with this. They, they can say, hey, I went somewhere and I changed yes. and really feel like there's a uh, there's power behind them in that statement because they can feel it. They experienced it, and other people around them, uh, they 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 disappeared for a little bit. And I think that's really important to uh, sometimes isolate ourselves mm -hmm. from those things that make us feel like we're in defense or uh, reactive, just long enough so that we can gain control of the moment. And and then what's nice about a retreat when you come back, you can reestablish yourself as a new person, and for other people, for their perception, it makes sense. You know. So true. I know early on in my transformational journey, I went away for, I don't know, probably about a week, over a week. And there's no question that when I came back, my relationships changed. Yeah. Um, because I had a new mind. I had a new way of viewing what I had been doing. Because you talked about in the, earlier on, we talked about going unconscious. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that we can do as I say, in an unexamined life, unconsciously. And when you yeah. have the experience of being in a very conscious environment for two days, three days a week, um, and then you go back, you cannot, it's, an, it's just impossible. You cannot go back and do things the exact same way. It doesn't work. Right. And really, so, I would say you shouldn't, you know, you no. should accept the change. Exactly. Um, it, I find that um, in, I've done a lot of traveling a lot of back and forth. I find that uh, for a lot of people, when they take a vacation from work, for example, when they come back to work or to the regular swing of things, it it creates kind of a pocket of an experience where the place that they're at, where, where they were and where they've come back to, tries to sew it all up like it didn't exist, kind of take it away, that people become overcome with, again, the reaction of their environment. Um, is there a, a good method to counteract the sense that um, an area or uh, people are all consuming to whatever kind of experience you may have had just prior? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So if you take a vacation from work, and yes. it's, let's say it's a week, a week away, yes. and you go have a wonderful experience, but then yeah. you come back and it's just the regular grind. You're yeah. back in that space and that place that you were at before. Is there a uh, a tool, a simple mind uh, mantra or tool that's good to keep the experience more fresh and uh, to help against the wave of the familiar? 
if that makes any sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, Well, two things come to mind. Sometimes vacations, um, when one comes back, they realize the way I have things set up aren't exactly what I want. That happened Mm -hmm. to me Um, when in a retreat came back and thought, I don't know why I live in the city. I don't want to live in the city. (laughs) Um, So it was actually instead of going back to status quo, I needed to really look at, I need to shake things up. So I would say I have two thoughts about that. So the one is maybe there's things that need to get shaken up. Maybe there's a reason why it's, it's hard to adjust. Maybe that life is not exactly a good fit for you any longer. And then be willing to ask the questions. Is there something here that doesn't fit for who I am now? So that's one answer to the question and another one would be what can you do in your current life that makes you feel like it's a vacation it's fun you're doing things you like to do it doesn't feel like same old same old grind Mm -hmm. so that's what i would say you know i did a um on instagram i I did a, a reel about you need to bring the fun back like mm-hmm. life should be fun it should not feel like no matter what kind of job one has it should still be fun yeah. you need to still make time to dance and to play and to do art and to take a walk and you know be stupid or silly or whatever so i think when life feels too hard and serious and this is a grind who would want to come back to that after yeah, a vacation right. <laughs> yeah and i and so it's what I heard there was uh, evaluation mm-hmm. of the circumstance yeah. and integration of the new experience into the old world. Well put. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and because perhaps there's changes that need to be integrated. Things that you learned on vacation, you're like, hey, I could take that back with me. Right. Maybe I like to get up early in the morning and do yoga. Okay. I mean, Maybe that's yeah. something I like to do. You can still do that regardless of where you live. Yeah, if yeah, definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's pretty, that's a good instruction too. Just to kind of, you know, reevaluate and integrate the new experience into the world. And to get back again to what's, you know, a really great practice is to try to achieve that that childhood brilliance, uh, seeing the world from the child's eyes, where, you know, it is fun. The everyday yes. life is fun. Yeah, I think that's, it takes a, uh, it's, what's really interesting about that practice, uh, the child's eyes practice is, it's something that you can actually play at, and in playing at, you're doing it. So, so true. you know, you become that thing which you're acting out, and uh, you can act enamored, surprised, you know, all these great um, energies of of the child seeing something for the first time. And that can be your everyday. It could be your first interaction or your next interaction with that same person. It's, you're so, it's so true. Like you, we have the choice in every day to see people anew, even if we live with them for 10 years, 20 years, whatever. Right. Um, Yeah. And it's like a spark, you know, maybe you'll put that spark in them too. Yeah. You know. That would yeah. be the, the goal, maybe, is to get that light from here to there. <laughs> well, it is contagious, out. regardless yeah. of how much they pick it up. It is contagious. Um, you're, you remind me um, when you talk about the um, child's eyes. And there is an exercise that I had learned that was called baby eyes. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe you know it as well. Um, but so baby eyes, um, babies stare at things and they have this like, they just look at you and with complete love and gratitude and appreciation for you. Mm -hmm. And that is a really great exercise. If you're having any kind of thing go on, like you're not that happy with yourself or somebody else, you can look in the mirror and do that to yourself, or you can do it with someone you're having some issues with. You can't help but fall in love with them. Um, So it's also very easy and simple um, exercise that you can do. And it brings much, joy to your heart i would say yeah yeah and 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 that's another tool <laughs> very good practice there, yes <laughs> another tool that you, could be done immediately yes. and somebody could just say you know what how about i know you're having a horrible day how about you just stare at me 
and just feel yeah. giddy. Yeah. Just, just all you have to do is look at me. Stare at me and yeah. be so happy. Yeah. yeah. So overcome with joy. Yeah. Just for a moment. I know the day is horrible, but do that and I will also do the same for you. I will stare at you and just be giddy and full of joy for who you are. It's true. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that when someone's having a hard day, it's hard for them to do it because they're yeah. already in that state. But it doesn't mean that you as the other person can't, all you have to do is look at them with baby's eyes. Whenever, I know for me and most people I know, when you're around a baby or a puppy, you can't help but smile. Yeah, oxytocin. Right? <laughs> so you look at that person who is yeah. struggling and you just send them so much love and you just look at them and just so much compassion. They can't help but at some point shift in your presence. Yeah. And I think that's a gift we can give to each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if um, somebody's listening, watching, and they wanted to get in touch with you. Yes. They wanted to get some uh, resolution in their life towards the, uh, the positive. Um, how can they find you? Yeah. So um, I have actually a link um, that I can share with you. Um, and it's an opportunity to do a, um, for somebody who feels like I really could use some help. I could use some tools. Um, I do a 45 minute, um, take you through some simple processes, help you look at kind of where the challenges are, where the struggle is, um, and help you experience some of the things that you didn't know were in your way. Um, and help you create a little bit of a strategy. So I have a link that I can share with you. Um, and then I have something for somebody who feels like, I actually am not ready for that, but I could still use a little bit of help. And that is, I have um, something I call the, um, the three hacks to own your yes and your no. Hmm. Um, and that is something that is actually downloadable and I can send you um, that link as well and we can share it if anybody... Yeah. Um, It'd be great. Well, well, I'll put them in the description so that great. they're uh, easy to find. Great. Thank you. Um, are they long links? Is that... Uh, no, they're not very long links. Well, feel um, free to... If you want to speak them out, that'd be great too. Yeah. Oh, well, you know what? It's longer than that. I mean, I oh, okay. kind of, <laughs> it, Because it's a... Um, it's a one... The um, the link for the, um, the session is on my... It connects to my calendar. So okay. it's... it's so that way, oh, it's a calendar link. It's a okay. calendar link um, so that you can set up some time. And then the other one is connects to a download. So that's a little bit longer as well. So um, probably best if we share it in the notes. Yep. It'll be in the description for the podcast and description for the YouTube as well. That way it's easy to click through and, and check out. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, do you have a website? I do have a website. It's um, Claudia hyphen Braun, B R A U N dot com. Um, okay. And you can read more about me there as well. Awesome. That's fantastic. And um, well, uh, any tips that you might have for somebody out there that might be interested in becoming a coach? I would say um, follow your passion and allow yourself to believe in yourself and your ability to do what it is that you want to do. Uh, I would say that if you have that desire, follow through. That's mm. what I would say. Because I think sometimes people stop themselves because they think, well, there's a lot of coaches out there. And um, there are a lot of coaches out there. However, there isn't a coach that's like you. And I know that there are certain people who really love me and they love the work that we do together mm -hmm. but there's going to be other people that i'm not a right fit for and so i know that whoever wants to be a coach and follows through then i know that there are people who need them and so i believe that whatever calling we're having it's our option uh to be listening and i think that's the greatest gift we can give ourselves and humanity truly i at this time, there are so many people that are struggling. And um, for all of us to show up in our brilliance is really needed right now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Nick, thank you. You're so really welcome. It's great to have the discussion with you and um, look forward to a future conversation. 
As do I. Thank you so much for having me as a guest on your show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Claudia. Have a good one. You too, Nick. Bye.